and I'll facilitate as soon as they're functional again. Um, I'm not allowed to sell books here, but I can facilitate with a publisher. This is a bit loud. In the back of my car, <laughs> the tailgate of my bucky. <laughs> um, and this I need to say quietly, if we do facilitate directly with the publisher, it's much, much, much less expensive. So. <laughs> Number two, um, during the, after the first lecture, an individual came to me. There was a question about Mapungubwe and the rock art around Mapungubwe. And I was fairly vague in terms of my rock art specialist daughter that she could access. There is a person here, and if, if you can uh, just repeat, uh, it's the Eastwood couple, married couple, archaeologist. He died a year or two ago of cancer, tragically, but he lived in the Sotpansburg. He lived in Lutrichard or Makado, or Lutrichard or Makado. This name changes all the time. Um, and wrote and did excellent research and wrote about rock art and did rock art around the, the Sotpansburg. Could you just put up your hand? Uh, that is our. Uh, source of information, Rakhad Mapungubwe. She also uh, informed me that the Wilton panel, Linton panel, who told me that? Linton panel, you remember? The, the cent centerpiece of our, uh, our uh, crest of South Africa is in fact in the museum. Most of it was taken out, and you can just walk into the museum and see it there intact. That rock art is, is available. And other nice ones. And as I said, and you'll see if you've ever been in the actual situation out in the field, that they are much better preserved and beautiful, beautiful stuff. So in this terrible stuff that they do to, did to chop out rock art, they actually did quite a good thing in terms of preserving them. And it's climate controlled. And uh, there was something else that somebody reminded me uh, an information shared. But you can come up with that. Uh, what I neglected to say yesterday about Karik is a lot of interest. A lot of the people came to me afterwards yesterday and before this lecture talk about Kariki. Um, just as one. Once I started writing about them, and we have a, a permanent exhibition, photographic exhibition on Kariki people in Karoo, in the middle of the Karoo, it's a permanent photograph. That draws a lot of attention, and also now that people are writing about them. So various groups came out to do documentaries from Germany, ARD1, the biggest channel in Germany. A lot of local channels, they did documentaries, won awards. Journalists came and, and with or without me, found the Kariki people, took them into town, gave them a beer or two, wrote about them, and won prestigious awards writing about them. Athol Fugard did his very first Afrikaans play ever, uh, Die Kariki Graf. It was here two years ago in Cape Town, uh, and by all accounts, wonderful stuff. He wrote about them through a student, an MA student of mine who concentrated, Rihanna Stein. She worked on the Kariki children, wrote the MA. Ethel Fugard in America uh, surfed the internet and found this MA and read about them and thought, this is, we should do a play about them. They've been, uh, the term Kariki people, you'll find for the first time in the most recent edition of Oxford, uh, Oxford Dictionary. It's become international. And, uh, and I traveled to Geneva and back to Geneva and back, wrote there and went and, and talked to many people. They have now been officially and formally accepted as a First Nation, uh, in, internationally accepted and recognized as a First Nation. Now, all of these things, to their benefit and to what extent? Not at all. These people don't go back. They can describe what this individual looked like. They say to me, Mike, Meneer, professor, boss, he was bald, and he had this color bucky, and he said, let me take pictures and stuff, but he wrote this very dramatic uh, bit about them, got awards and allocations, uh, um, acknowledgement and so on, and he said he's coming back and going to give them a lot of money for education for their children, did all sorts of problems. ARD won the night that documentary was, was uh, shown in Germany, they had 1.4 million viewers. 
Not a word from any of these people ever again in terms of benefiting the Kariki people. I'm there, I'm there next week, back in the Karoo, for a reason that I forgot to mention yesterday. You can't see this very clearly. I don't have a slide of it. This is a Kariki dog. Uh, they all look rather similar, the dogs. You can look at this afterwards. And I had geneticists with me, and I had a dog researcher, specialist with me at one stage. And we all looked at these dogs and thought they're rather special. Short of it was, is we think it's Canis Africanus, descendants of the original African dog. But we don't know, so we need to find out. And a good way to find out is DNA. Here I've got the apparatus, <laughs> icely sealed. And we're also going to do the donkeys. You know why this might, might be true and might be special? Because of the relatively isolated way of life, the itinerants and the isolated mobile community, and they don't intermarry too much, nor do the dogs <laughs> and the donkeys. One little challenge remains. I had to get a substantial amount of saliva out of the mouth of a donkey and out of the mouth of Canis Africanus. Have you seen the teeth of a donkey? <laughs> The dog? Next week. If anybody needs information or can share information with us afterwards, after this week, I mean, I've got my card here. Please feel free to email or to phone or just to communicate. I'll respond. I've been getting good feedback from individuals, a lot of specialists in this audience interested in X, Y, and Z, and I love to follow up, and I like to communicate and keep the communication, communication channels open. Yes, sir. Madam, sorry. I wanted to know how much doing genetics for you on the dogs and donkeys. I'm doing the sampling, uh, and the wear gloves. Not surgical gloves, I need better stuff, you know. Karina um, Schlebusch is her name, and Mario, uh, a doctoral student assistant, they at Uppsala University in Sweden. She's a postdoc, ex-student of ours from WITS, from the genetic center there. In one audience, I had a, a slightly similar question. I said, what's wrong with our genetics in the country? Why are you working with Sweden? Why Uppsala University all over there? What do they know about Africa? Why do they want to do Kariki people, Essequa people in the base? I said, we are working with South African specialists. He's now functioning in Sweden. They were out here just uh, last year uh, for a couple of weeks, and we sampled this area. As I said, I think yesterday, 163 samples we did in that particular area. It was already dark. There's no campfire this time. <laughs> And they were sort of huddled together in small little groups, speaking softly to each other, and glancing up towards the mountain, the mountain and the foothills of the Langeberg. They were worried. Some of them were scared. They had been called into town because for weeks now, the mountain and the foothill seem to be on fire, much like the Western Cape at the moment. Fire all along the crest of the mountain for weeks on end. And not only for weeks, for months. People had been busy in those communities up and, and below the mountain rebuilding, redesigning their huts by instruction, making a, a back exit, which those Mikey's Hesa never had, those little houses made of mats, woven mats. They were manufacturing weapons. They were planning to kill off all their stock by instruction. 
because a prophet, one young pal, had communicated with them. He got this message from his supreme being, supreme power, and he called himself rather modestly, Onsa Liva here, our dear Lord. Classically, in anthropology, this was a revitalization movement, sometimes called nativistic movement, sometimes called a culture adjustment movement. More often than not, <clears throat> a response to a situation that they call relative deprivation. This was 1788. <coughs> Just one year before, there was land dispossession. Maybe I should show you where this was. The Drosdy in Swellendam, 25th of October, 1788. There's our friend, the millenarian prophet, Onsen Leven here. And the magistrate, the Langrost of the then Swellendam gave this instruction that all the farmers must come into town, also the commandos, because there's trouble. These people were, were almost setting the mountain alight. They were dancing around the fire every night. They were mobilizing. So this Landrost Onkreit, those of you who understand any Afrikaans will understand the symbolism of Onkreit, it means weed. Onkreit said, all come into town. We need to defend Swellendam. These guys are coming for us. Relative deprivation, as I say, land dispossession, 1787, just one year before that at Rafir Shoner End. Those of you who travel the end too, it's only about 40 kilometers from Sonnendam. Land dispossession took place. The 1713 and two further epidemics of smallpox had taken its toll. Entire communities were decimated by the smallpox etc., etc. Land encroachment by pioneer farmers incrementally up the coast and into the interior, the east coast in this case. So this, in terms of analysis, formal anthropological analysis, ideal situation for the initiation by a prophet of a millenarian or nativistic or revitalization or cultural adjustment movement to redress, to address this very negative situation in that community. It's happened all over the world. It's happened throughout history. One, uh, Adolf Hitler, was a wonderful example of a cultural adjustment revitalization movement. And always these leaders are remarkable individuals in their own right. But remarkable, especially because they had their finger on the pulse of the feeling and the conditions, the circumstances of their people. They could touch the right nerve and say the right thing. We've got a young politician in this country who is very adept at this. He has these little sound bites without, if I may say so, not much substance, but he's getting the response in hundreds and thousands and hundreds of thousands of people a prophet. I don't know whether he's read into this bit of anthropology, but this is what it is. Okay, fast forward 230 years later. I was lying in bed fast asleep, not sitting around the campfire, and my phone rang. And I answered and said, It's Reggie. I said, Reggie, you know, it's two o'clock. Um, do you realize? I, I, yeah, yeah, he knows. I had just given him the previous morning um, a research report on the Hesequa people, the area between Swellendam and Riversdale, or more accurately, Albertinia and uh, Storm's Flay. That was um, the area that the Hesequa frequented, and I say frequented, not resided in. They were pastoralists, they were mobile people, they were moving around that area. I'd done work in that area, 
I was, let me start at the beginning. I was invited by the Essequa Archaeology Association in Still Bay, asked to come and talk there. So the first question, I said, wow, Essequa, it used to be the Langeberg, I think, uh, municipality. Why is this called the Hesequa Municipal Area? It includes Riversdale, Albertinia, Stilbay, Malkoutfontein, Little Calatown near Stilbay, Heidelberg, Slangrefeer, that is Hesequa. And why, why Hesequa Archaeological Association? And then I, I gave the talk and chatted to people and started asking around and I became intrigued. I wrote, this was a preliminary project, wrote a research report, and two o'clock, Reggie phones, says, Mike, I've got a problem. I'd given him this report the morning before. So I thought, oh my goodness, what have I now said or done or written? Uh, because he's quite an active and prominent member in that, of that community. And he said that he couldn't put it down. He's read it from cover to cover. And he thinks it's a wonderful way of opening up a window onto the lives, the history, the heritage of these people. He literally said, Die licht opgegaan. There was clarity, he said to me that night, that morning. Ek is a mens, ek is a koi. I am a person. I am a koi koi. I'm a koi koi. Now, Reti Busak um, today is the stamwolf of the Hesekwa the chief of the Hesequa. Does Bushak ring a name? Ring a bell? Quite correctly so. That guy is his brother. They're four brothers. This is one, and the well-known one is another, and then there's another minister. They're all men of the cloth, except one, and they've got a sister as well. Um, as was Reggie. He's now the acknowledged, uh, formally, um, leader of the Hesequa people. Back to 230 years before around the Drosdi, these people standing around and the magistrate, the Landros talking to them and said, you know that guy, Jan Perl, is a Zot. Z-O-T means he's mad, he's crazy. As it turned out, and this carried on for months and, and even years, and he ended up, uh, nobody knows where, then came to the fore again, eventually uh, at Genadendal, the mission station. It was then called Babianslof, where Georg Schmidt, the missionary, act, was active. We'll get back to that just now. And then even in Stellenbosch, he settled there. But it was an unsuccessful revitalization or millenarian movement. It fizzled out. But the reasons were real for this attempt at redress and addressing this. Now, first recorded in Van Riebeek's Dag for All, that's in 1660, when Eva told Van Riebeek of a certain other tribe called Aquas. Which we had never before heard mentioned. And 17th century travelers like Peter Kratov, 1667, was bartering with a new nation towards the east, about 14 days from here, and near a, a large river. These were the Essequas who grazed their herds beyond the storm's flay on the Sonder End River, along the Breda River, that's at Solendam, as most of you know, and even as far east at least as Riverdale. Now you can see the old wagon route on that map. This is the area we're talking about. And that is where they function. Now with this sort of still by experience of mine talking there, hearing about Hesequa and so on, I was intrigued and stimulated. And what I ended up doing was to walk, to hike, to climb, to crawl, to bleed in that region, looking for the spoor, trying to follow the spoor, looking for evidence of these Hesequa people. And it was easy to find. 
although they're also forgotten people and even invisible people, their spur, their track is very evident if you know what you're looking for, if you know where to look for it. Examples of early travelers, I've got a whole lot there. Um, Peter Kratov, 1667, Olof Berg, 1682, 1683, Schrever, 1689, Jan Hartog, 1707, you can carry on like that. Now, if you cross the river, just on the other side of Riversdale, you'll see a sign that says, Choko. That was the early most powerful and most influential chief of all the Khoi in the eastern region of this country. That is now south of the Khoret River. Incidentally, if you're looking at boundaries, not only the uh, current uh, uh, towns, the rivers, the one is the Khoret River, and the one in the south is very roughly the Breda River. It's between those rivers that these people moved around. Now, Khauko, if I may say so, that river was appropriately and properly renamed uh, not so long ago by the Riversdale, now Hesekwa municipality. It used to be called the Kafir Kales Rafir. It's now Khauko, named for this great chief of the Hesekwa. And Khauko, it's incorrectly spelt. I've told a series of two mayors already in Riversdale of the Hesekwa area, they're spelling it incorrectly. But Khauko, the name of the chief, means black or dark. He was also known to the Dutch as the Swart Captain, the black chief. Uh, it also has an implication of fat or fatty. Not obesity, but well off, opulent. Most cattle, most influential. And at Riversdale, there's a river still called the Groote Fette Rivier. It was renamed by the Dutch, but before that, what was it called? It was called the Gauko River, before they named it. And you know close to here of a place called Botrevier. Same chief, same reason, Bot, Botter, Butter, Fet, Fat, Gauko, right here. Because they did move this far, beyond their traditional area, for purposes of trading cattle. Gauko. The Dutch called him the older here, the old gentleman. And his son, Hakwa, no, Hakwa, that's a difficult one. That exclamation mark and the Q are two different clicks. Very difficult to go, combine it in a. Swarte Jongen. They called him also the black young man of the black chief, the dark. It's by virtue of the rivers, the Botrefir and the Fetterefir, if you looked at them and if you've traveled the old passes through near Nature's Valley and that and looked at the, the river, rivers or streams, my, my children used to refer to the Coca-Cola water. And it's because of the vegetation and the color of the water. There's no other implication, really. Van der Stel, the oldest chief and most powerful of all the nations. This you, you will uh, remember I used in the first lecture just to indicate this was by Kolb or Colby in 1731 already. Already an early indication of uh, distribution and people they found. Slightly, in, no, quite inaccurate. You remember I, I pointed out the Essequa right up there and Mossel Bay is down there. They weren't ever that far north. And I'm saying that uh, advisedly because sometimes they sent a small group of people to make contact with us. They might, some of them might have been there, but this was not the sort of core part of their area. And Koopman and Gunjaman were leaders of other Khoi communities at that stage. That very left top, Susakwa, that refers to Bushman, the son, the early son of that area that, that these people used, these people used that term to refer to. So now a nice title to that, a new map of Cape of Good Hope. There you are. If you're disoriented, get hold of this and it'll be okay. <laughs> a slightly better effort from Gilumi and Benga. It's a, a nice volume on general and uh, general history of South Africa, a glossy, hard covered, the new history of South Africa. And uh, this is um, 
by Elphick, the historian. He's now back in the United States, did wonderful work on the history of the Khoi uh, herders. Uh, he's got one very nice book called Kral and Castle. You can maybe look at that. Elphick, the historian. Accurate, let's have a closer look. We're right here where we are. They called, as a category or a group of Khoi, they called them the peninsulas because they were around here in the peninsula and they were the Khori Haikwa, Kona, Khori Haikwa, and the Khora Kukwa. And then as you go up the coast, Chinokwa, the east coast I mean, Chinokwa, and then the Hesekwa that we now are uh, talking about. Then at the Khoritz River, Khoritz, like in Khorikwa, and then as you go towards Port Elizabeth, Damaskwa. Inland areas, not much about the uh, the Khrikwa yet, why? If you look on the west coast, you can see Kochokwa. They were there, closer to Cape Town or Table Bay or uh, Table Mountain. And then you see Khurikwa. Eventually, and this is somebody spoke to me this morning from Paketberg, who had spent a lot of time in Paketberg. That is where the Khrikwa actually uh, originated. But as a rather motley bunch, uh, at that stage, there were cattle rustlers and all kinds of uh, nefarious sort of activity-wise people in that area. And a missionary once had suggested to them, said, look, you, you need to identify. And these people started calling themselves Khurikwa, Khurikwa, and now Khrikwa. And they are at Khrikwa Stad, uh, mainly, near uh, Kimberley in that area. Um, but then they moved. They had their own great trek and moved to Philippoulis, so southern free state until they lost their land through bottle, a single bottle of brandy. They'd give away most of their pasturage to the, to the pioneer farmers at that stage. And then followed the next great track to Griekeland East, near Natal. And Kokstad, one of the main towns in that area, for Adam Kok, their leader, their chief at the time. So the Griekwa have been all over. But they, haven't, they hadn't settled down then yet. They moved on again, at least one house or one branch or one faction of the Khoi moved to just 10 kilometers from Plettenberg Bay at Kranshoek. That's one of the main Khrikwa uh, uh, houses is at Kranshoek under Le Fleur, their chief. So that's a bit about the distribution. Now, where did they come from? <clears throat> this is a massive debate. Um, not only in my discipline, but certainly historians for much longer have been speculating about this. And also um, uh, geographers, obviously, in the spatial sense, and then linguists and archaeologists, importantly, and perhaps most importantly, the geneticists got, came into the picture. L various theories, what they all agree about, that the first Migration originated in what is today northern Botswana. And that's also where they had contact, effective contact, with some of the local hunter-gatherers who were already there, like they were in South Africa, the San or the Bushmen. And that's where the click came from. They got much of the click language from those local people and then started migrating south. Again, I need to just remind us to what I said on the first day, not migration like a massive rapid movement of lots of people south. It was slow and incremental over generations and over centuries and even over thousands of years. This started 2,000 years ago. They started moving south. But which route did they take? Oh, let me just say this. Were they actually the pastoralists with cattle who came down and, and uh, sort of uh, started pastoralism for the Khoi in all these areas in South Africa, up the East Coast and in Essequa area, or was it the practice of pastoralism that was passed on from one group to another and eventually ended up in the South? It's fairly clear now, according to the geneticists, they've been uh, studying uh, the genomes of these people, particularly the Nama or the Namakwa, and it seems that uh, lactase or lactose persistence is the key to all of this. All over the world, people have or have not in adulthood the ability to digest milk properly. Pastoralists have this di digest. Uh, ability, enzyme. Yeah. 
most other people from after the age of about six, seven, maybe eight, lose that ability. And here we have that allele, as the geneticists say, it's there, this ability, this enzyme to, and it seems to be clear now that they were pastoralists who came from Northeast Africa to Northern Botswana to eventually South Africa. So that other theory of just the practice of pastoralism by contact and, and interaction with people, you, you learn about cattle and you learn about stock and you learn to become a pastor. That is not it. It was actually the people themselves with their cattle that migrated. But the route now, that east cave was a very popular one. They said went east and then came south. But what about the pasture and the water for the cattle if they had their cattle with them? It's very dry, very arid area, not really conducive to people with cattle in that area, and particularly also here. This other possibility, due south, not a bad option, particularly as you come to the Orange River or the Kharib River. There's water, there's pastures, and then they moved, and they, in the uh, uh, folk remembrances of of the Korana people, it's documented, they said, our people moved towards the west, towards the big water, and they migrated towards the west coast along the Orange River and then south into what is now Namakwa land. And that's where they stayed, the, what are, the, the, the Khurut Nam, Nama or Khurut Namakwa and the Klein Namakwa, two communities of Nama who came down, and some went further in it possibly. But what about all these in the east coast? southeast coast over here, including the Essequa people that we're looking at. They came south, and it seems that a nice option would have been right through the Karoo. But it's arid, it's dry, we saw yesterday. What about pasture? But there's the Sequoia. You remember the famous Sequoia River of yesterday? Where the pioneer farmers went up the Sequoia River with their horses and everything else, and eventually their stock to settle as pioneer farmers in the Karoo. So possibly these these early koi came down that river. And what makes sense to me, I might even say not even as an answer, as an individual, just looking at all the evidence, genetic evidence, linguistic, archaeological evidence, all of that. As you move from east, Damasqua, um, Khorikwa, Hesekwa, down to Chinokwa, these people down the coast, in terms of seniority, of these communities and the chiefs like Khoko. He was one of the most senior chiefs in the east. As you move west towards Cape Town, they become less senior, which seems to fit with the practice that they had. And now back to the migration. It was slow and it was incremental. A little clan or a little group might just split off and go further looking for their own pasture. Or there was a, a matter of disagreement in terms of leadership, a headman under the chief might say, okay, I'm taking my little group and moving off. Um, and that's the way that they e eventually ended up there and established other communities, from more senior to, to less senior. But this lactase persistence thing is, is a very important and interesting contribution to this whole matter. Essequa way of life. <coughs> Mikey says so. <coughs> And the Mikey's name, like Mikey Serfir and Mikey's Fontaine, it's not just coincidental. That's where you found the palmit, a particular kind of uh, rush. The rushes growing in those rivers is what they used to weave the mats. And the mats they used to make these uh, Mikey Saiser, these houses of woven mats. You can see the framework that they, they first put up. and. Uh, in the Makwa land still today, there are a few of these houses remaining around Okip and Nambabip. I don't know if anybody's traveled there. And I once, uh, not once, I frequently went to Swellendam to the museum and, and delved in their archives. And I had a change of management. And there was a new guy there that we, we met and we discussed. And I shared with him this, this idea that we sh should perhaps think of reconstructing some of these Mikey's as, a, as a, a museum display in an in a open space behind the main buildings. And he says, it's a wonderful idea. And I say, I've got, you know, I've done research, I've got all the exact mini uh, measurements, and then some species spinonium, these rushes, I can find the right plant and the leaves, we can do all of this stuff. And he said, uh, Mike, that's interesting, that'll be helpful. But maybe I can also contribute a little bit. 
I said, wow, okay, that's going to be nice. He says, I grew up in a Mikey says. <laughs> he was from Namakwaland originally, and his grandfather, as a young son, he used to live with his grandfather. It was this biggish one, the Mikey says, and then he showed me, pulled out pictures, he said, look, this, this is my grandfather's house, here's me standing next to grandfather. That's the court case, the sort of smoke, black and dark and smaller, that's where they cooked, and there we are. So the descendants like him are there and they're becoming more aware of this ancestry and this heritage and becoming proud of this. Um, Swellanda Museum, Drosdi Museum, nice place to visit. Language, <coughs> we've spoken about all the clicks. Picked up, as we say, <coughs> we suggest from North Botswana, San or Bushman, perhaps a dress, very flimsy kind of dress. <coughs> you saw the, the first slide and this. This is more or less just covering the essentials and the karos, skin, bit, and so on. Um, and then the Mikey says, we saw there and discussed, there's another version. This is an artistic impression of a nice, sedate domestic sea next to a river. Some of the stock around and the Mikey says over there. And the kraal we saw, it was always in a horseshoe shape where at night they would put the, the, the stock, the cattle, the cattle mainly in the big part of the enclosure and left the enclosure, <coughs> enclosure they'd either put the calves or, or the goats and, and the sheep uh, overnight. Kinship was, part, was patrilineal from father to son in terms of inheritance and in terms of succession. Um, pastoralism, a way of life of course, and then leadership by virtue of Personality, influence, skills, uh, respect, not by virtue of anything else. That's how Chalko became well respected and his followers uh, in numbers probably most impressive of most of the Khoi leaders of that time. I have a description of one <coughs> traveler, Kratov, who was moving east and just as he went over with his whole group, uh, came over the last rise. It was also late afternoon, and they looked down on the Feta River, the river that used to be called Choko, and is now in its lower reaches towards Stolbai, is now again called Choko. And they looked down, and again it was late afternoon, early evening, and there was fire, a lot of campfires, but a lot of campfires. He said he saw about 17, 16 to 17, independent kraals grouped around this main kraal of Gauko. Now, if you work at the average of about 100 individuals, we're extrapolating a bit in terms of a domestic unit within a, in a uh, Mikey says, uh, what incidentally was called hubris, hubris, um, and then calculate thousands of people grouped around Gauko, followed him because of his lead leadership sk skills and his influence. And by virtue of that, of course, he had influence over more people than any other chief at that time. And the Dutch at the Cape recognized this. And when they uh, sent em emissaries out, they would always say, go to the old year, the old gentleman. And he even visited here yeah, in the castle uh, once or twice, had an audience with the leadership of the Dutch at that stage. There were skirmishes and battles between the Khoi and the San Bushmen at that stage, but uh, not of a serious nature, but there were several other, you can classify them as wars between the Dutch and the Khoi. But uh, again, in terms of fatalities, this is the way they, the, they measure uh, the degree of a particular skirmish of war, they say so many people were killed on this side, so many people. Are, uh, if you take that statistic, those skirmishes and, and the so called wars between the Dutch and the uh, Khoi weren't all that significant. The smallpox, the first of which was in 1713, was much, much, much more severe, devastating. Devastating. Entire communities were just wiped out. They had no resistance. It came by way of a ship. I had the name of the ship here somewhere, uh, here in Cape Town, with dirty washing from the east. And that's where they contracted this smallpox. And it spread like wildfire up the coast and towards the Indian. Some individuals fled towards the in interior, uh, but many communities 
never escaped. They were just wiped out totally. Some of them ended up in the Kuru. And by oral tradition and so on, it's very clear, or almost clear, that some of them ended up as Kariki people as well, who came from these parts, fleeing the smallpox, the first, the second, and the third epidemics at that stage. Now, um, beliefs and rituals, this Chui Khwap was a, the creator. He ensured posterity, and you had to have good relations, keep your, your situation with him in good stead. And then there was one, uh, I don't have that listed here, just called Khaunab. He was evil, and he called sickness, and you need to tread very carefully as far as he was concerned. And then there's that nice one, Haitsi Aibup. He was a folk hero, a kind of magician. He did all these wonderful things unexpectedly. He was a nice guy, exciting guy adventurous sort of person, nice to have around here somewhere, um, to the extent that for him, and particularly also for the Tsui Huap, the creator, people would walk from A to B, and you could see it in some places still, uh, except for the canola and the wheat fields that have been cleared. Now there are these massive piles of stone that the farmer took out because it causes damage to his plow. It's very very stony sort of area. You know, you've got all these pebbles all over that, from Caledon up towards the area that we're talking about. Uh, but they used to walk from, and, and the belief was you must pick up a stone, and as you pass that particular spot, you just put the stone, stone on this little pile. And these huge cairns of stone were created by passers-by who were paying respect to those people up there who are looking after them, not people, those spirits who are looking after them. But now it's confusing. You walk and crawl and bleed in that area, looking for evidence, the spur of the people. You find recently created such a need to distinguish. The archaeologists have warned us, and some excellent work was done just outside Swellendam on the Breda River. We'll, we'll see, I think, an example of that just now by archaeologists. And what they warn us about, you need to be so, so sensitive pastoralists in terms of where they stay, that sort of place is ephemeral. They come and they go. They don't leave all that much evidence because they don't stay in a particular place. And they pick up their house and they go. They don't leave it behind. That was a wrap, a wrap up, a wrap around. The Mikeys they would put on the pile on the back of the oxen and also sometimes the supporting structure and they'd go away. But in the vegetation with aerial photography and so, I mean, if you've had a cattle crawl, that space between this half circle of huts, from up there, even the canola and the wheat and the ordinary vegetation just looks slightly different because of many, many generations of cattle being kept in that particular place. The, the evidence is there, but it's not as, as, as explicit, not as easy to find as most other settlements of most other people, but exciting stuff. by an early traveler again, uh, the real, the Khoi people's real. The original uh, reference to that was Hotno's real, also because of the terminology that was current then. Maybe I should just talk about that particular. We've got a, a little slide on terminology just now, but when the Dutch arrived on the shores of South Africa, they met up with these people, and they were they actually always received in quite a friendly sort of way. And they heard the people talk. And some of the early Dutch writers said they, they don't have a language. They gaggle like geese. It's just a it's not a language at all. They can't communicate. We just go, we use sign language because they make all these funny noises. And then other Dutch came and wrote and said, no, this language, this language of theirs is, is like a, that of a stutterer, hakelaar, stutterer. In Dutch, a stammerer. So they called them Hottentot. Yet another story is because, and when they, they uh, invited these people in a friendly way, say, welcome to our, our surroundings, and eventually the Dutch said, wow, you've got nice cattle. I'm interested in those fat cattle and stuff. They would do a dance, a welcoming dance. that went called the Hottentot. So the derogatory stigma attached to Hottentot and Hottentot is really not uh, justified if this was the true 
reason for the use of the word not until actually quite a positive thing, referring to a song, a welcoming song by the hosts to the visitors from Europe. But they did the dance. This was a traditional dance. There were small villages like uh, 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 Slangerfeer. I'll refer to that again now. That's near Heidelberg, just off the N2. I could still find the clay surfaces that they made specially. And during full moon, I would go out and dance the reel, the Koya reel. And early travelers sketched them dancing. This is only one slide of many. And what some people attempted to do, you might remember or not, the early cartoons or the early movies, they, they actually sketched a human being in a certain position, and then the next position, and then the next position, or this position and that position. And if you have all of those and you project it, you actually get, actually get a movement. And they, they tried to recreate this real dance, and fairly successfully because Accompanying the sketch, this particular recorder or artist also put a sound like O A E U O A. You can actually recreate the rhythm of the dance. If even just some of this is accurate that they did at that stage, then the reel that does dance now and the competitions of the reel now in this country, which is good and it's wonderful, and they've gone overseas at a folk dance competition, one group that won the, on an annual basis in Paul, they have this competition of the real groups, the stoff trappers and the others, they've got all these names, and they compete doing the real against each other. The winning uh, group went over to America to a folk dance competition and won five out of the seven competitions with that real. But if this is only partly accurate, then they're not really dancing the real anymore. But it's a, it is a, a rather special dance that they are doing. Now, decline and decimation, but let me just, yeah. Stock, they were enticed, of course, by trinkets, particularly metal, copper, and eventually alcohol, and let go of their cattle in ever increasing numbers to the extent that the chiefs lost their authority, their power with their depleting stocks, even Chalco, uh, although the worst of that was to come after it, it passed on. And then, of course, colonial encroachment. The farmers just started moving into the interior and up the west coast and also up this east coast of ours, as it were. And then, of course, the, the uh, effect of, of missionaries if I may say so. And let me give you an example. I was at a workshop last year at Ghanadendal, Babian Sloof, a mission station. These wonderful old buildings that Georg Schmidt and others had put up there. Uh, they take you on a tour, even if you're attending a conference or something. And they took us a tour, and they took us straight to a cemetery, a graveyard, with all these missionaries. Missionary so-and-so, and the wife of the missionary, and the child of the missionary, only six months old, died in. Uh, whatever the case may be, in a wonderfully kept, impressive graveyard. And we walked out there and everybody said, ooh, oh, thank you for that tour. And the anthropologist said, ooh, oh, thank you for that tour, but where are the people who really stayed here in the first place? Where are the people that the missionaries came to tend to? And they said, oh, sorry, there's another graveyard over there somewhere, just beyond that hill. And I said, if you don't mind, I'd like to see it. So we again walked and climbed and crawled and bled and found this overgrown, massive, massive graveyard of deceased Hesekwa people who were ministered to by the, by the missionaries. But the extract from one of the things and the, the response and the effect of the mission task, and I say this with respect, there was one Magdalena, the Dutch called her, her real name was Fetge Tekeya. You can see how I refer to, to her there in, in the 1700s. She was the first female um, to be um, ministered to, if you like, by the missionaries at Genadendal, by the Moravian missionary George Schmidt. This was exactly in 1737. And this is what she said. It was recorded. And all that remains of her and her presence there um, is a little plaque in the corner of one of the yards there. 
Schmidt wanted to teach us things like how to live off vegetables, and he did not want our small number of stock or to take our land like other white people. But at Genadendal, everything was not enjoyable. I learned to read and write more quickly than the others, and the other women became jealous because of this. It was very difficult to give up my beloved New Testament, but I want to cry my heart out with my people. Then we danced the reel again, and we sang the songs of our ancestors. More and more I noticed things that bothered me, for the reverend all was koi koi conditions, and they were wrong. He used to shout, sin, it's all wrong, these things that you are doing. But Tachmas and Kate took their babies, according to our Hesekwa custom, to the nearest hill and showed them how to stretch out their little arms. We showed them which one is our clan's, our clan's star mother. Everybody then sang, O Tsui Khuap, give us rain so that the fruit and bulbs in the felt can grow. Give us a good year. I could see that the missionary did not approve of this at all. We could not even dance when the full moon appeared. So it was really hard to accept the new faith with my whole heart. She was the first female evangelist ever in South Africa, and this is a little extract of, of her particular experience. Then, of course, as I've said a number of times, the disease and epidemics caused devastation amongst these people, 1730, but also again 1755 and 1767. And then, of course, dispute protest because of, of um, land dispossession. Just as a matter of interest, I'm just staying down the road uh, in a little hotel on the banks of the Lisbjerg River. How far would the Lisbjerg be from here? Just a few hundred years, yards, maybe a thousand or two thousand yards. The first formal land dispossession in the history of South Africa took place just four years after von Rieberg landed at the Cape, and it was on the banks of the Lisbjerg River. Now, this in later years became a massive um, force in, in the lives uh, of these people as people farmers, pioneer farmers, started moving up both the coast, but also um, to the interior. Of course, there was conflict. We had Jan Perl, once a living year, our dear Lord, and his efforts at response to land dispossession and everything else. But having said all of this, disease, conflict, uh, the epidemics, uh, encroachment on their land, all of this fades into insignificance, in a sense, when compared to the depiction, the description, the documentation, what I call the writing of the koi, the writing of the koin koin, the way they were written out of the history or the way they were written into the history. It's a kind of epistemic violence in the real sense of the word. No comment. Sarah ba Bartman, taken to London and Paris, displayed in a glass case for those Europeans to come and Google at her. Um, she was asked to pose in exactly that, that sort of way, and even asked to turn around and, and uh, take different positions so that these Europeans can have a good look at her genitalia. This is what happened to some of these people. This is an extreme example, of course. She turned eventually into an alcoholic, um, and there's now a monument to her near in the Longkloof, near the little town of Hanke. Okay. Now, the earliest voyagers came here, these visitors who were danced to, who were received quite well, but they looked at these people with jaundiced sort of eyes, insensitive ears. You heard what I said, they didn't hear they couldn't understand this language. And they described these people, described what they looked like, they described the way they dressed or didn't dress, their diet, their language or non-language, and even the way they smelt, their odor. This is what the early dis dis depictions of these people were. And for just 10 years, the Dutch called the Chinokwa, Chinokwa. The Dutch called the Hesekwa, Hesekwa. 
just 10 years. And then they started placing them in a category, like we discussed the other day, of colored, in this case, hot knots, hot and tots. They no longer use the terms, their own terms for themselves. So they were put in inferior status and eventually in servitude as this category of people called Hottentots. Okay, perceptions and depictions. I, I won't go into all that much detail there. It's a question of freedom of movement. They no longer had cattle after a while. They ended up as servants on farms. The legislation bit and the colored thing we'll, we'll discuss in our last lecture on Friday just to try and pull all these things together. And of course, as I said just now, they also became proselytes at mission stations like Fetgete Keia, but they were also recruited into the colonial military, uh, lost their identity and became uh, servants in every sense of the word. Those are the terms I mentioned. Loss or not is still used by some individuals in the Karoo today, meaning a person looking for work who is not into a permanent uh, position or employment and loss or not is available for occasional or a job or two. <clears throat> now, I looked at some of our, our literature uh, as in this regard. Like this, it was a, a bilingual dictionary uh, by Bosman et al. in 19th century. It went into seven, seven editions, and it lists hot not as meaning hottentot or cape colored. A standard history text, this is Muller, the editor, 1980, also a third edition, which was widely prescribed to both English and Afrikaans, um, at both secondary and tertiary level students uh, still used the hot and tot term throughout. And then a text by L.J. Fenter, a man I have great respect for and his writings. He called it uh, this, this really influential book of his, Colored, a profile of two million Africans. Now it's a sympathetic kind of writing, but uh, he has a section called Hot and Tot Origins of the Colored People. And then he says, the local inhabitants which the Dutch found at the Cape were generally a disappointing lot. There was little industry amongst them, the Hottentots preferring to wander about with their fat-tailed sheep and cattle. Now what else do pastoralists do? <laughs> what else do stock farming people do? Unless they have somebody to do it on their behalf, which is what incidentally, ironically, and tragically ended up. They no longer had their own herds, but they were looking after the cat their cattle belonging to the farmer now, and still just walking around looking after the cattle. Prominent American anthropologist, a colleague of mine that I met once, he was fairly well respected. He called it Africans an ethnological account, and he said this is to reach new levels of insight into African society. In a chapter dealing with African subsistence and production patterns, he indicates that cattle raising without agriculture amongst the Khoi or Hottentots would have grouped them with the Herero, that's the Namibian people, amongst others, except for differences in racial type. However, the Khoi have long since disappeared. <laughs> Mr. Schneider. Let's just look at some of these terms now. I've, I've, a number of times referred to the proper spelling of khoen, meaning, uh, let me give it a, a, a 2017 meaning, eminent people. The khoi khoi originally meant men of men, quite chauvinistic. Now, if you're going to use then from that khoi, men or man, if you're just using khoi, and then the son that people now seem to prefer the media, it's out there in the public domain. If you use khoi son, what you're literally saying, man without cattle. If you're just using son, you're saying people without cattle, and you're implying thieves, because they didn't have cattle and they stole the cattle of the koi, so the koi called them son. The son never called themselves son. They called themselves Tan or Haikum or Kum or Bushman more recently. Every single community and settlement that I've ever worked in or visited uh, and even the descendants of, like the Kariki people say, we are Bushmen. I'm not saying that we should push because Bosishman, Boshaman, that's what the Dutch, that's where the word comes from. And they also just categorize, say, these little guys from the bush, Bosishman, Boshaman, Bushmen. Not saying we should promote that word, but this is the word they're still using for themselves. 
The best call is to use the actual original word of that community, that term that they use for themselves. For the Karu is Kong, Kong, the descendants of Okum in Namibia, Haitkum in Namibia. Those are the people. And I'll facilitate as soon as they functional again. Um, I'm not allowed to sell books here, but I can facilitate with a publisher. This is a bit loud. In the back of my car, <laughs> the tailgate of my bucky. <laughs> um, and this I need to say quietly, if we do facilitate directly with the publisher, it's much, much, much less expensive. So. <laughs> Number two, um, during the, after the first lecture, an individual came to me. There was a question about Mapungubwe and the rock art around Mapungubwe. And I was fairly vague in terms of my rock art specialist daughter that she could access. There is a person here, and if you can uh, just repeat, it's, it's an Eastwood couple, married couple, archaeologist. He died a year or two ago of cancer, tragically, but he lived in the Sotbansburg. He lived in Lutrichard or Makado, or Lutrichard or Makado. This name changes all the time. Um, and wrote and did excellent research and wrote about rock art and did rock art around the, the Sotbansburg. Could you just put up your hand? Uh, that is our. Uh, source of information, Rakad Mapungubwe. She also uh, informed me that the Wilton panel, Linton panel, who told me that? Linton panel, you remember? The, the cent centerpiece of our, uh, our uh, crest of South Africa is in fact in the museum. Most of it was taken out, and you can just walk into the museum and see it there intact. That rock art is, is available. And other nice ones. And as I said, and you'll see, even they at Uppsala University in Sweden, she's a postdoc, ex student of ours from Witz, from the Genetic Center there. In one audience, I had a, a slightly similar question. I said, What's wrong with our genetics in the country? Why are you working with Sweden? Why Uppsala University all over there? What do they know about Africa? Why do they want to do Kariki people, Esekwa people in the base? I said, we are working with South African specialists. She's now functioning in Sweden. They were out here just uh, last year uh, for a couple of weeks, and we sampled this area. As I said, I think yesterday, 163 samples we did in that particular area. It was already dark. There's no campfire this time. And they were sort of huddled together in small little groups, speaking softly to each other, glancing up towards the mountain, the mountain and the foothills of the Langeberg. They were worried. Some of them were scared. They had been called into town because for weeks now, the mountain and the foothills seemed to be on fire, much like the Western Cape at the moment. Fire all along the crest of the mountain for weeks on end. And not only for weeks, for months, People had been busy in those communities up and, and below the mountain, rebuilding, re edition of Oxford, uh, Oxford Dictionary. It's become international. And, uh, and I traveled to Geneva and back to Geneva and back, wrote there and went and, and talked to many people. They have now been officially and formally accepted as a first nation, uh, in internationally accepted and recognized as a first nation. Now, all of these things, to their benefit and to what extent, not at all. These people don't go back. They can describe what this individual looked like. They say to me, Mike, Meneer, Professor, Bas, he was bald and he had this color bucky. And he said, let me take pictures and stuff that he wrote, it's very really dramatic. A bit about them, got awards and allocations. Uh, uh, 
acknowledgement and so on. And he said he's coming back and to give them a lot of money for education for their children. That all sorts of problems. ARD won the night. That documentary was, was uh, shown in Germany. They had 1.4 million viewers. Not a word from any of these people ever again in terms of benefiting the Kariki people. I'm, ne I'm there next week, back in the Karoo, for a reason that I forgot to mention yesterday. You can't see this very clearly. I don't have a slide of it. This is a Kariki dog. Uh, they all look rather similar, the dogs. You can look at this afterwards. And I had geneticists with me, and I had uh, dog researchers, specialists with me at one stage. And we all looked at these dogs and thought they were rather special. Short of it was, is we think it's Canis Africanus, descendants of the original African dog. But we don't know, so we need to find out. And a good way to find out is DNA. Here I've got the apparatus, <laughs> nicely sealed, and we're also going to do the donkeys. You know why this might, might be true and might be special? Because of the relatively isolated way of life, the itinerance and the isolated mobile community, and they don't intermarry too much, nor do the dogs <laughs> and the donkeys. One little challenge remains. I either get a substantial amount of saliva out of the mouth of a donkey and out of the mouth of Canis Africanus. Have you seen the teeth of a donkey? <laughs> and of the dog? Next week. If anybody needs information or can share information with us afterwards, after this week, I mean, I've got my card here. Please feel free to email or to phone or just to communicate. I'll respond. I've been getting good feedback from individuals, a lot of specialists in this audience, interested in X, Y, and Z. And I love to follow up, and I like to communicate and keep the communication, communication channels open. Yes, sir. Madam, sorry. I'm doing the sampling uh, and I wear gloves. Not surgical gloves, I need better stuff. You know? um, Karina Schlebusch is her name, and Mario, uh, a doctoral student assistant, if you've ever been in the actual situation out in the field, that they are much better preserved and beautiful, beautiful stuff. So in this terrible stuff that they do to, did to chop out rock art, they actually did quite a good thing in terms of preserving them. And it's climate controlled. And uh, there was something else that somebody reminded me uh, an information shared. But you can come up with that. Uh, what I neglected to say yesterday about Karik is a lot of interest. A lot of the people came to me afterwards yesterday and before this lecture talk about Kariki. Um, just as one. Once I started writing about them, and we have a, a permanent exhibition, photographic exhibition on Kariki people in Karoo, in the middle of the Karoo, it's a permanent photograph. That draws a lot of attention, and also and other people are writing about them. So various groups came out to do documentaries from Germany, ARD1, the biggest channel in Germany. A lot of local channels, they did documentaries, won awards. Journalists came. and, and with or without me, found the Kariki people, took them into town, gave them a beer or two, wrote about them, and won prestigious awards writing about them. Athol Fugard did his very first Afrikaans play ever, the uh, Kariki Graf. It was here two years ago in Cape Town, uh, and by all accounts, wonderful stuff. He wrote about them through a student, an MA student of mine who concentrated, Rihanna Stein. She worked on the Kariki children, wrote the MA. Ethel Fugard in America uh, surfed the internet and found this MA and read about them and thought, this is, we should do a play about them. They've been, uh, the term Kariki people, you'll find for the first time in the most recent edition.